The end of Malkin Tower. The shades of night had fallen on Downham Manor House, and with an aching heart and a strong presentiment of ill, Mistress Nutter prepared to quit the little chamber which had sheltered her for more than two months, and where she would willingly have read her latest sigh if it had been so permitted her. Closing the Bible she had been reading, she placed the said volume under her arm, and taking up a small bundle containing her slender preparations for travel, extinguished the taper, and then descended by a secret staircase, passed through a door fashioned externally like a cupboard, and entered a summer house where she found old Crouch awaiting her. A few whispered words only passed between her and the huntsman, and informing her that the horses were in waiting at the back of the garden, he took the bundle from her, and would fain have relieved her also of the Bible, but she would not part with it, and pressing it more closely to her bosom, said she was quite ready to attend him. It was a beautiful starlight night, the air soft and balmy, and laden with the perfume of the flowers. A nightingale was singing plaintively in an adjoining tree, and presently came a response eagerly tender from another part of the grove. Mistress Nutter could not choose but listen, and the melody so touched her that she was half scared by repressed emotion, for alas, the relief of tears was denied her. Motioning her somewhat impatiently to come on, Crouch struck into a sombre alley edged by lit yew trees, and terminating in a plantation, through which a winding path led to the, to the hill whereon the mansion was situated. By daylight this was a beautiful walk, affording exquisite glimpses through the trees of the surrounding scenery, and commanding a noble view of Pendle Hill. The dominant point in the process, but even now to the whole lady, so long immured in her cell like chamber, and deprived of many of nature's choicest blessings, it appeared delightful. The fresh air, redolent of new mown hay, fanned her pale cheek and feverish brow, and allied her agitation and excitement. Perfect stillness, broken only by the lowing of the cattle in the adjoining pastures, by the drowsy hum of the door fly, or the rippling of it in the valley, further calmed her, and the soothing influence was completed by a contemplation of the serene heavens, wherein was seen the starry horse with a thin bright crescent of the new moon in the midst of them, diffusing a pearly light around her, one blot alone appearing in the otherwise smiling sky, and this was a great ugly black cloud lowering over the summit of Hendel Hill. Mistress Nutter noticed a potentious cloud and noticed also a shadow on the hill, which might have been cast by the find himself, so light was it to a demonical shape with outstretched wings, but all shuddering at the idea it suggested, she would not suffer it to obtain possession of her mind, but resolutely fixed her attention on other and more pleasing objects. By this time they had reached the foot of the hill, and the gate admitted them to a road running by the side of Downham Bay. Here they found the horses in charge of a man in a dark red livery of Nicholas Asherton, and who was no other than Tom Shaw, the rascal cockmaster. Delivering the bridles to Crouch, the knave hastily strode away, but he lingered at a little distance to see the lady mount, and then leaping the hedge, struck through the plantation towards the hall, clinking the money in his pockets as he went, and thinking how cleverly he had earned it. But he did not go so unpunished, for it is a satisfaction to record that in walking through the woods he was caught in a gin place there by Crouch, which held him fast in its iron teeth till morning, when he was discovered by one of the underkeepers while going his round in a deplorable condition and lamed for life. Meanwhile, unconscious either of the manner in which she had been betrayed or of the punishment awaiting her betrayer, Mistress Nutter followed her conductor in silence. For a while the road continued by the side of Brooke, and then quitting it commenced a long and tedious ascent running between high banks fringed with trees. The overhanging burrows rendered it so dark that Mistress Nutter could scarcely distinguish the old huntsman, though he was not many yards in advance of her, but she heard the tramp of his horse, and that was enough. All at once, where the burrows were thickest and the road darkest, she perceived a small fiery object on the bank, and in her alarm called out to the huntsman, who, looking back for a moment, laughed and told her not to be uneasy, for it was only a glowworm. Ashamed of her idle fears, she rode on, but had not proceeded far when, looking again at the bank, she saw it stood with the same light. This time she did not call out or scream, but gazed steadily at the twinkling fires, hoping to get the better of her fears. Her alarm, however, rose to absolute terror, as she beheld glowworms, if glowworms they were, twist together and form themselves into a flaming brand, such as she had seen in her vision. Grasped by the angel who had driven her from the gates of paradise, averting her gaze, she would have hastened on, but a hand suddenly laid upon her bridle, held back her horse, and she then perceived a tall dark man mounted on a sable steed 
riding beside her. The supernatural character of the horseman was manifest in as much as no sound was caused by the tread of his steed, nor did he appear to be visible to Crouch when the latter looked back. Mistress Nutter maintained her seat with difficulty. She well knew who was her companion. So, Alice Nutter, said a horseman at length in a low tone, you were chosen to shut yourself up in a narrow cell like a recluse for more than two months, denying yourself all sort of enjoyment, practising severest abstinence, and passing your whole time in useless prayer. Aye, useless, for if you were to pray from now till doomsday, come when it will, a thousand years hence, or tomorrow, it will not save you. When you signed that bond to my master, sentence was recorded against you, and no power can recall it. Why then these unavailing lamentations? Why utter prayers which are rejected, and supplications which are scorned? Shake off this weakness, Alice, and be yourself again. Once you had pride enough, and a little of it would now be of service to you, you would then see the folly of this abject conduct, humbling yourself to the dust only to be spurned, and suing for mercy only to be derided. Pray as loud and as long as you will, the ears of heaven will remain ever deaf to you. I hope otherwise, rejoined the lady meekly. Do not deceive yourself, replied the horseman. The term granted you by your compact will not be abridged, but it is your own fault if it be not extended. Your daughter is destroying herself in the vain hope of saving you. Her prayers are unavailing as your own and recoil from the judgment thrown on her. The youth upon whom her affections are fixed is stricken with a deadly ailment. It is in your power to save them both. Mistress Nutter groaned deeply. It is in your power, I say, to save them, continued the horseman. By returning to your allegiance to your master, he will forgive your disobedience if you prove yourself zealous in his service. He will restore you to your formerly worldly position, avenge you with your enemies, and accomplish all you may desire with respect to your daughter. He cannot do it, replied Mistress Nutter. Cannot echo the horseman. Try him. For many years I have served you as familiar, and you have never set me the task I have failed to execute. I am ready to become your servant again, and to offer you a yet larger range of control, but put to no limits to your desires or ambition. If you are tired of this narrow sphere, take a wider look abroad, but do not shut yourself in a narrow cell, and persuade yourself you are accomplishing your ultimate deliverance, when you are only wasting precious time, which might be more advantageously and far more agreeably employed. While laughing at your folly, my master deplores it, and he has therefore sent me as to one for whom, notwithstanding all derelictions from duty, he has still a regard, with an offer of all forgiveness, provided you return to him at once, and renew your covenant, proving your sincerity by casting from you the book you hold under your arm. Your snares are not laid subtle enough to catch me, replied Mistress Nutter. I will never part with this holy volume, which is my present safeguard, and on which I built my hopes of salvation. Hopes which you propose have revived in my breast, for I am well assured your master would not make them if he felt confident of his power over me. No, I defy him and you. I command you in heaven's name to get hence and to tempt me no longer. As the words were uttered with a howl of rage and mortification, like the roar of a wild beast, the dark horseman and his steed vanished. Alarmed by the sound, Crouch stopped and questioned the lady as to its cause, but receiving no satisfactory explanation from her, he bade her ride quickly on, affirming it must be the bogart of the cloth. Soon after this, they again came upon Downham Beck and were about to cross it when their purpose was arrested by a joyous barking, and the next moment Grip came up, the dog appeared, having shut up in the stable, his company not being desired on the expedition, but contriving in some way or other to get out. He had centred his master's horse, and in the end overtaken him. Crouch did not know whether to be angry or pleased, and at first gave utterance to an awe, and raised his whip to chastise him, but almost instantly the latter feeling predominated, and he welcomed the fateful animal with a few kind words. A hey, suppose thou thought I could not do without thee, grip, he said, and mayhap they were to break. They are now across the bed, and speeding over the wide brown waste, the huntsman warily shapes his horse so as to avoid any limestone quarries or turpits. He points out a jack-o'-lantern, dancing merrily on the surface of a dangerous morass, and tells a dismal tale of a traveller lured into it by the delusive light and swallowed up. Mistress Nutter pays a little heed to him, but ever and anon looks back as if in dread of someone behind her, but no one is visible, and she only sees great black clouds still hovering over the pendulum. Hill. On, on they go, their horses who now slashing through the wet sod, now beating upon the foot till last is her, a merry bride in being there.
Black Myers are at hand, but Crouch skirts them safely. Now the Bullfrog rolls in the marsh, and then booming tells of a bitten passing by. They see the mighty bird of them with his wide, heavy wings and long neck. It howls at them, but is instantly checked by his master, and they gallop. They are now by the side of Pendle Water, and within sight of Lovely. What a munchless force! I take the lady's rest. The ground she tramples on was once her own. The woods by the riverside was planted by her. The mansion before her once owned her as mistress, and now she dares not approach it, nor does she desire to do so. For the sight of it brings back terrible recollections and fills her again with despair. They are now close upon it, and it appears dark, silent, and deserted. How different from what it was of your in her husband's days, the husband she had only slain, speak on old huntsman, lash your panting horse. So the remorseful lady will bar out for you, or she rides as if the avenging furies were at her heels. She is rattling over the bridge, crouched, toiling at her. Shouts you were to moderate her case. She looks back and beholds a grim old house, frowning full upon her, and her is her huntsman and dog are left behind for a while. But a steep ascent soon compels her to slacken the speed, and they come on crouch, swearing lustily, and grip with his tongue out of his mouth, limping as if for so. The road now leads through a thicket, the horses stumble frequently, for the stones are loose, and the footing consequently uncertain crouches a fall, and here he can remain. The lady is gone. It is useless to hurry after her, and he is proceeding slowly when Grip, who is a little in advance, growls fiercely and looks back at his master as if to intimate that danger is at hand. The huntsman presses on, but he is too late. If indeed, he could at any time have rendered effectual assistance. A clearing in the thicket shows him the lady dismounted and surrounded by several wild looking men armed with calibers. Part of man bear her shrieking off, and the rest fire at him, but without effect, and then chase him as far as the steepest part of the hill. Down which he dashes, followed by Grip. Arrived at the bottom, he pauses to listen. If he is pursued, and hearing nothing further to alarm him, face with himself what is best to be done, and not liking to alarm the village, for that would be to betray Mistress Nutter. He gets off his horse, ties him to a tree, and with Grip close at his heels, menses the ascent of the hill by a different road from that he had previously taken. Meanwhile, Mistress Nutter's captors drive her forcibly towards the tower. Their arms and appearance left her, no doubt they were the predators, and she saw to come them. She had neither money nor valuables in her possession. They laughed at her assertions, but made no other reply. Her sole consolation was that they did not see to drive her on the Bible. On reaching the tower, a signal was given by one of the foremost of land, and the steps being lowered from the high doorway, she was compelled to ascend them, being pushed along a short passage obscured by a piece of tapestry, but which was drawn aside as she advanced. She found herself in a circular chamber, in the midst of which was a massive table covered with glass and drinking cups stained with wine. From the roof, which was crossed by great black beams of oak, was suspended a lamp of green burners, whose light showed that the walls were garnished with petronels, rapiers, poignards, and other murderous weapons. Besides, they were hung from pegs long riding coats, sombreros, visards, and other robber accoutrements, including a variety of disguises from the clowns, friars, he jerked into the gentleman's velvet doublet, ready to be assumed on an emergency. Here and there was an open valet's or a pair of saddlebags with their contents strewn about the floor, and on the bench were a dice box and shuffleboard, showing with the flasks and goblets on the table how the occupants of the tower passed their time. A steep ladder like flight of steps led through the upper chamber, and down these, at the very moment of Mr. Smith's entrance, descended a stalwart person who eyed her fiercely as he leapt on the wall. There was something in the man's truculent physiognomy and strange and ugly vision that reminded her of Mother Envy. Welcome to Mountain Tower, madam. Said Robert, and Dawson had reflected her set. We have met before, but it is many years ago, and I dare say you have forgotten me. You will guess who I am when I tell you my mother of Hyde's power before. Finding Mistress Nutter made her remark, he went on. I am Christopher Denby, madam, Captain Denby, I should say. The brave fellow who brought you the river are part of my band until lately. Not unknown and borders of Scotland used to be our scene of action, which had seemed to hear of my word all through the death. I thought he could not better than take possession of her strong, which evolved upon me. By right of inheritance. Since our arrival here, we kept ourselves very quiet and the country for taking us for spirits or demons never approached our hiding place. While as all our depredations are confined to distant parts, our retreat has never been suspected. This concerns me little of the mistress of the cold. Pardon me, madam, it concerns you much as you will learn and know. But be seated, I pray you, he said with mock civility. I am keeping you standing all this while. But as the lady declined the attention, he went on. I was fortunate enough in first coming back to this part of the country.
countries. People spend their acquaintance with your relative legalist activism and being invited me to stay within that town and it was so well pleased with my society that he could not endure to part with indeed exclaimed Mr. Another. Are you the person called Lawrence Swan? The same replied empty and no doubt you would hear a report on me, madam. Well, it suited my purpose to say, or I was very hospitable in entertained by the squire, who, except he rather shoot much edited from lectures and psalms to me, as pleasant a whole as one could desire. Besides which, he was obliging me not to employ me, borrow money for him, and what I got I get you made sure. I would willingly be spared the detail of the original neighbour he said to me with a somewhat impatient way. I am coming to an end, rejoined Dempy, and then perhaps you may wish you had all along then. All the squire's secrets were committed to me, and I was fully aware of your concealment in the hall, but I had never asserted the size of where you were going and which character you are, and only away the opportunity which has presented itself now. If you think you obtain money from me, you will find yourself safe, said Mr. Sutter. I have parted with all my possessions, but to whom, madam, cried Emily, with a sinister smile, to your daughter, and I'm sure she is too gentle, too tender hearted to allow you to suffer when she can relieve you. You must get us a good round sum from her, or you will be detained here long. The dungeons are dark and unwholesome, and my band are actually harsh in their treatment of captives. They have found in the vault some instruments of torture belonging to old Blacker, the freebooter, the efficiency of which is an obstinate case I fear they might be inclined to try. You now begin to see the drift of my discourse, madam, and understand the sort of men you have to deal with. Barbarous fellows, madam, in you main dogs, and he laughed coarsely at his own jocularity. It may put an end to this discussion, said Mistress Nutter firmly, if I declare that no torture shall induce me to make any such demands on my daughter. Think harass I am jesting with you, madam, rejoined Dempty. Oh no, I believe you capable of any atrocity, replied the lady. You do not either in feature or belly your parentage. Ah, say you so, madam, cried Dempty. You have a sharp tongue, I find. Curse say is thrown away upon you. What for, lads, Kenyon and Lawton? Take the lady down to the vaults, and there let her have an hour for solitary reflection. She may change your mind in that time. Do not think it, cried Mistress Nutter resolutely. If you continue obstinate, you will find means to remove you, rejoined Dempty in a taunting tone. But what has she got in me? her arm? Give me the book. What's this? A Bible? A witch with a Bible? It should be a grimory. Aha! Give it me back, I implore of you, shrieked the lady. I shall be destroyed, soul and body, if I have it not with me. What you are afraid the devil may carry you off without it? Oh, oh, roared Dempty. Well, that would not suit my purpose at present. Here, take it, and now off with her lies without more ado. And as he spoke, a trap door was opened by one of the robbers. This was in the white of steps leading to the subterranean chambers down which the miserable lady was dragged. Presently the two men reappeared with a grim smile on their ruffianly countenances, and as they closed the trap door, one of them observed to the captain that they had chained her to a pillar by removing the band from the great skeleton and passing it round her body. You have done well, lads, replied M.D. approvingly. And now go, all of you, and scour the hilltop and return in an hour, and we will decide upon what is to be done with this woman. The two men then joined the rest of their comrades outside, and the whole troop descended the steps which were afterward drawn by them. This done, the robber captain returned to a circular chamber and for some time paced to and fro, revolving his dark schemes. He then paused, placing his ear near the trap door, listened, but as no sound reached him, he sat down at the table and soon grew so much absorbed as to be unconscious that the dark figure was creeping stealthily down the narrow staircase behind him. I cannot get rid of Nicholas Ashton, he exclaimed at length. I somehow fancy we shall meet again, and yet all should be over with him by this time. Look around, thundered a voice behind him. Nicholas Ashton is not got rid of so easily. At this unexpected summons, Dempsey started to his feet and recoiled aghast as he saw what he took to be the ghost of the murdered squire standing before him. A second look, however, convinced him that it was no phantom he beheld but a living man armed for vengeance and determined upon it. Get a weapon, villain, cried Nicholas in tones of concentrated fury. I do not wish to take unfair advantage of thee. Without a word of reply, Dempsey snatched a sword from the wall and the next moment was engaged in deadly strife with the squire. They were well matched, but both were powerful men, both expert in the use of their weapons, and the combat might have been protracted and of doubtful issue. But for the irresistible fury of Nicholas, who assaulted his adversary with such vigour and determination that he speedily drove him against the wall, where the latter made an attempt to seize a petronel hanging beside him. But his purpose being divined, he received a thrust through the arm and dropped his blade, lay at the squire's mercy. Nicholas shortened his sword, but for to strike, seizing his enemy by the road, hurled him to the ground, planting his knee on his chest, called out, What for, Nance? Nance? exclaimed Dempsey. Then it was that mischievous jade who brought you here. I replied the squire, as the young woman came quickly down the steps, and I refused her aid in the conflict, because I felt certain of 
mastering thee, and because I would not take odds even against such a treacherous villain as thou art. Better dispatch him, squire, said Nance. He may do a mischief yet. No, no, replied Nicholas. He is unworthy of a gentleman's sword. Besides, I have sworn to hang him, and I will keep my word. Go down into the vaults, and liberate Mistress Nutter, while I find him, for we must take him with us tomorrow. He shall lie in Lancaster Castle with his kinsfolk. That remains to be seen, muttered Emdy. Be on your own guard, squire, cried Nance, as she lighted a small lamp and raised a trapdoor. With this caution, she descended to the vaults, and while Nicholas looked about her along, and perceived a rope dangling down from the wall near him, he seized it, throwing it with some force towards him. A sudden sound reached his ears. Clang, clang, he had rung the alarm bell violently. Clang, 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 would it never stop? Taking advantage of his surprise and consternation, Demdi got from under him, sprang to his feet, and rushed into the doorway, instantly let fall the steps roaring out. Treason to the rescue, my men, to the rescue. His cries were immediately answered from without, and it was evident from the tumult that all the band were hurrying to his assistance. Not a moment was to be lost by the squire, hunting through the trap door, closed it after him, bolted it underneath. At the very moment the robbers entered the chamber, Demdi's rage at finding him gone was increased when all the combined efforts of his men failed in bolting open the trap door. Take hatchets and who it all he cried. You must have it. I have heard there is a secret outlet. And though I have never been able to discover it, it may be haunting that. I will go outside and watch him. He and hear me so come all instantly. And rushing forth, he was making a circuit of the tower and examining some bushes at his base when his hope was suddenly seized by a dog before he could utter an explanation. Much less sound his whistle or use his arms. He was grappled by the old woman and dragged off to a considerable distance. The dog still clinging to his foot. Meanwhile, Nicholas had hurried down into the vaults where he found Nancy sustaining. Half fainting and hastily explaining what had occurred, she consigned the lady to him and then led the way through the central vein to pillars, past the even image until she approached the wall. When holding up the lamp, she revealed black marble slab between the statue of Latin and I saw pressing against it, the slab moved on one side and disclosed a light stairs. Go there, right down to the squire, and when you get to the top, you'll find another sword with a knot in it. You cannot miss it, or would you cry the squire, who would not move me? I am come presently, right down to the strange. I had some two birds that only boss MD had set a trap for himself and all his followers, and it's for me to catch a great for me about a hundred yards from the tower, no one knew his hand. Nicholas did not very clearly understand, but concluding the dance as some well, hidden the meaning in what she said, he was almost hesitating left to obey her. Having got clear of the tower as directed with Mistress Mother, he ran on with her to some distance when what was his surprise to find crouching grip and watch over the prostrate robber she had words from the huntsman twice to explain how this had come about. There was scarcely to when the Nance was shot in breathless haste, crying out, Off, oh, farther off, I can value your lives. Seen from her manner that he lay with dangerous, Nicholas and Crouch made hold of prisoner, bore him away between them, while Nance assisted mistress to her along. They had not gone far when a rumbling sound like that was seen in the nowhere it was heard. All looked back towards Malton Tower, the structure was seen to rock flame burst all from the earth, and with a tremendous Explosion heard from miles around and we shut the ground where Nicholas and the others stood a hole of the unhallowed fabric base the summit blown into the air. Some of the stones would get to an extraordinary distance. A mine charged with gunpowder appeared and even lay beneath its vaults by MD due to its destruction at some future period and this circumstance being known to that she had fired the train. Not one of the robbers within the tower escaped. The bodies of all were found next day, crushed, burned, or frightfully mutilated.